Good evening. My name is Nancy Gutierrez, and I am privileged to serve as the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at UNC Charlotte. On behalf of the university, I would like to welcome you tonight, to tonight's TIAA Craft Lecture, an annual talk that has already become one of the university's signature intellectual events of the year. I know I speak for all of us at the university when I say how appreciative we are to TIAA Craft for this endowment, which makes this evening possible. In a minute, you will hear from Chancellor Phil Dubois and from Kevin Murphy, Chief Technology Officer of IT Production Services at TIAA CREF. <clears throat> but I'd like to take this occasion to recognize several individuals who've contributed to this evening's talk. In the past three years, we've heard thought-provoking talks from policy leaders from the international arena, from education, and from food science and public health. And individual colleges have sponsored each of these talks. Tonight, recognizing the breadth of the topic we are featuring, ethical challenges posed to the public sphere and to business and legal systems by technological advances too swift to keep up with. In other words, issues of privacy, information technology, and security, four colleges have come together to sponsor Frank Pasquale, our speaker. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleague deans who are joining me as host. Dean Steve Ott of the Bell College of Business, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Dean E. Deng from the College of Computing and Informatics. And Dean Nancy Faye Jensen of the College of Health and Human Services. In addition, Dr. Gordon Hall, director of the Center for Professional Applied Ethics, has been integral to the planning of this event. Please join me in thanking these individuals for help. <laughs> I also want to especially thank Provost Joan Lorden for suggesting this topic to us in early fall. As UNC Charlotte takes leadership in the world of data science and business analytics, we have an even greater responsibility to ground human-centered inquiry within this emergent and expanding knowledge area. And the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is the site in the university where such inquiry logically occurs. As the foundational college of the university, with departments and programs covering the humanities, social and behavioral sciences, and the natural sciences and mathematics, CLAS faculty and students work across these knowledge areas with the broad goal of understanding the world and our place in it. And this is especially the case when in times like the present, cultural, current cultural practices and political and financial systems, um, whoop, let me start over again. This is especially the case when in times like the present, the expanding powers of science and technology disrupt current cultural practices and political and financial systems. But, our, but as our speaker tonight will outline, disruption perhaps is the least of our worries. And speaking of disruption, please silence your cell phones and electronic <laughs> devices if you haven't done so already. As we all know from our own personal experiences over the past 20 years or so, the concept of privacy is much changed. Just think about outmoded public telephone booths and closed physical structures designed to keep our conversations secret. Now phone booths have disappeared, and many of us reveal sensitive details of our personal lives in very public places as we talk on our cell phones and think nothing about who is overhearing these sometimes intimate particulars. How we think about our private lives clearly has affected how we think about how we represent ourselves in public. So, and in, and in perhaps contradictory ways, we are redefining our public selves. In this previous example, the person who is talking on the cell phone in a public place, whether intentionally or not, is putting herself on display. She may not be aware that she is the object of attention, but she is at some level, whether great or small. She's also putting herself on display, as we all do, anytime she makes a keystroke when on the internet. Even if she is in the privacy of her own home or in the workplace, a world is watching her that captures her information. And this is in addition to her self-conscious display when she deliberately shares information about herself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. And what does this world know about her, or think it knows about her, from the many, many keystrokes it captures? This seeming disjunction between private and public, as we interact more and more in the electronic medium, 
complicated by our understanding of when and how we display ourselves, and further complicated by the lack of control we have over the meaning that is generated by this display, is a cultural and political phenomenon that is only beginning to be explored and studied. Our speaker tonight will be helping us understand the consequences of this phenomenon from his perspective as a scholar of information law. There will be a Q&A, as I'm sure many of you will have questions to ask about this fascinating and perhaps frightening topic after the speaker talks. And if you want to follow up on this topic beyond this evening's talk, we have cards available that will tell you how to purchase Mr. Pasquale's book. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Philip Dubois, Chancellor of UNC Charlotte. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight for the fourth edition of the annual TIAA-CREF lecture at UNC Charlotte. And I know that uh, many of you are basketball fans, and there's a lot going on tonight, so <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Uh, TIAA-CREF has been a great partner for this institution uh, since the company made the big move from up north in 2001 down to Charlotte. And in fact, it was just this week that we had a senior leadership team visit with us about additional uh, p potential points of partnership between the company and the university, including the initiative that Nancy mentioned in data science and business analytics. Now, for those of you who have seen me at events like this, you know that I like to inject a little bit of humor into the proceedings. But <laughs> My wife is saying, oh, God. So. Uh, but I, I have to tell you, I, I worked hard on this, and it's been kind of a disappointing day. Um, <laughs> I went to Google, and I w tried to find jokes, humor, related to our hosts, our colleagues at TIAA CREF, about what they do. And so I tried to look, I looked up, literally, jokes about pension managers. <laughs> and the first thing that I turned up, it said actuaries. So here's what I learned. There are three kinds of actuaries, those that can count and those that can't. <laughs> so that was no good. I went, to, I went to jokes about investment advisors. So question, how do you make a million in the stock market? Answer, start with two million. <laughs> so I was desperate. So <laughs> I went to life insurance because I happen to have a TIAA CREF life insurance policy. It's awesome. So this is what I learned. Life insurance is like a car. The company president drives. The marketing department has its foot on the gas. The underwriters have their foot on the brakes. And the actuary is looking out the rearview mirror screaming directions. <laughs> so like I said, it's been a dim day. Um, <laughs> So I know many of you have been here before, but for those of you who have not been here, let's, let me just tell you a word about this facility. This facility opened in the fall of 2011. It has been our main outpost away from the main campus uh, up in University City since then. Uh, we used to have a very small presence in Center City, Charlotte, since about the mid-90s, about 15,000 square feet. But it turned out that wasn't big enough to get us much notice with the greater Charlotte business community. So we acquired this property in about 2004 under the leadership of our Chancellor Jim Woodward. And then I was very fortunate when I became Chancellor in 2005 that we were able to secure an appropriation from the legislature to actually build this facility. And it took four or five years to actually get it built. But it's 143,000 square feet of space. So it allowed us to make a substantial statement about the presence of UNC Charlotte in the center city of Charlotte. And this is a home to all of the graduate programs in the Belt College of Business, our uh, Master of Urban Design in the uh, College of Arts and Architecture, and also professional programs in almost all of our remaining colleges are offered here, uh, including the College of Education, College of Health and Human Services, College of Computing and Informatics, which is also located the uh, new, new Data Science and Business Analytics program down here as well. Uh, this semester, there are 73 classes offered here, and in any given night, we'll have about 900 students located in this building. So it's a, a very active and involved facility, and we're very proud of it, and we're glad you could be with us uh, as well. We do a lot of special events here. We have about 500 per year, 
in this facility. And so we're able to bring about you know, several thousand people in connection to the university just by coming into this building. Um, if you notice during the uh, reception, we are, there's a public park being built here for two blocks between here and the Children's Museum, which is called Imagine On to the South. And eventually, all of that ground will be leveled up so that when you walk out of the back of this building, you'll walk right into the park. And then about 100 steps to the right, you'll be able to catch the light rail line that goes all the way to the campus starting in 2017. Let's hope. Um, <laughs> Let me introduce now Kevin Murphy, as uh, Nancy said, the Chief Technology Officer of IT Production Services at TIAA CREF. Uh, in his role at, this, at the company, he oversees the strategy and operations for all components of the firm's information technology infrastructure, including network and telecommunications, computing and end user support, including the firm's 24 by 7 data center operations. And he also uh, advises the company on the multi-year investments that they need to make in information technology infrastructure. He has uh, led a strong partnership with our institution, including a very large internship program with UNC Charlotte. In fact, TIAA, excuse me, TIAA CREF, I got to get it right, get, I got to learn how to spell or buy a vowel. Um, <laughs> they're the largest single employer of our students uh, in the city from the College of Computing and Informatics. He's contributed a great deal of advice for us. He's been on the um, Dean's Advisory Board for the College of Computing and Informatics, and he's actually taught uh, courses in our Financial Services Informatics program as well. So please welcome your host, Kevin Murphy. Thank you. It's always such a hot act to follow. I, I don't know why they keep putting me last. Anyway, it's, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, both as an affiliate of TIA CREF and, and, UN, and UNC Charlotte. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to introduce Frank, who is our guest speaker. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Frank, and I couldn't do it without the notes because his credentials are so long and lengthy um, and exquisite. So fr Frank is our, our 2015 TIA CREF um, Distinguished lecturer, 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 lecturer. He's a professor of law at the University of Maryland. Francis King Carey School of Law. Dr. Pasquale's research addresses challenges posted to information law by rapidly changing technology, which, you know, I, I love the opening up here because most people in my firm call my area the black box. So <laughs> this, is, this, this actually feels very, very good. Um, he's particularly focused in, in law, healthcare, internet, and the finance industries. He is a member of the National Science Foundation, funded council for big data ethics and society, and an affiliate of Yale University. So with that, it's an honor to introduce Frank. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I so appreciate that, and I just wanted to thank um, Chancellor Dubois, Dean Gutierrez, um, CTO Murphy, um, and all the folks that have been such wonderful hosts here. Um, I am really thrilled to see, uh, see a big fan of uh, trains and train travel, the, um, the construction of the light rail and the connection between UNC Charlotte and the Center City. I think that's wonderful to see. And um, I just have had a terrific day today on campus with some incredibly bright students um, interacting with them about the future of automation and the future of big data um, and with deans as well. And so it is just a real pleasure and honor right now to be able to sort of cap off the day um, with a public lecture, and I hope that I can get through my slides relatively quickly so I get some questions from the audience, because I'd love to hear your perspectives on a lot of these black box problems. So let's begin. Um, here you will see uh, two images that I hope will convey a bit of the substance of my book. And one is, you know, I always want to surprise uh, folks, and you may be rather surprised to know that the black box is orange. Um, but, <laughs> but this is actually um, a black box from a plane. Um, and you may know that whenever there's a tragedy, uh, when a plane goes down, um, they always try to find the black box. And of course, this one has the black box encased in orange, so it's easier to find. And the reason why they try to find it is because these black boxes are measuring literally tens of thousands of data points on, in any given uh, uh, plane that's traveling. And now, things like them, event data recorders, are in our cars. Um, they'll be in all the cars relatively soon. Um, and you can increase the amount of monitoring just exponentially given ever-cheapening sensor networks, ever greater data storage capabilities, and ever more intense data processing. 
So that's a really important black box that describes the, our conditions of our age. And what we're finding out nowadays is that we, in many ways, are like the plane. Okay, we're like the plane, we're like the car that's being monitored because almost every step we take, if you have a relatively advanced cell phone, that's going to be monitored as to where you are. An accelerometer maybe is taking track of what your gait is like, how you're walking. Um, you, with a new Apple re Health Kit and Research Kit, you may be able to attach these things to like your heart rate, other issues like that. And what's kind of troubling about that whole area is that the law has not really caught up with that. Uh, the law is sort of based on an analog age, a paper-based age of people signing uh, documents and say agreeing or not agreeing, consenting or not consenting to data use. And that's one of the problems that the book really tries to address. The second metaphor of the black box is the engineer's black box. So I appreciate the engineers here, and I, I imagine you'll like this uh, diagram just to the bottom on the right, where essentially the black box is when input goes in, output goes out, but we don't know how it was transformed. And that's an increasingly important aspect of our lives as well because there are many scores about us that really matter and we don't know how they were actually done. We have a rough sense of, say, how a credit score is done, but we don't really know all the algorithms in that process. Um, what's been re reported more recently that I think is quite disturbing is there are literally thousands of scores about us that we have no idea even exist. Okay? So there are scores like frailty scores, medication adherence scores, fraud, fraud likelihood scores, there are actually specialized, hundreds of specialized credit scores that you'll never see. You know, they're out there, they're floating around about you, they can be changing or, or, or be performance indicators for you, but you'll never actually see them, and that's one of the things the book addresses as well. So to sum up, you know, the big message of the book on the abstract level is that we are like the cars or planes that are being monitored by this monitoring black box, but the data is ultimately being transformed in ways that we can't comprehend well enough and that we need some helps to comprehend. Um, the other thing that I'm going to show you is uh, lots of images of rating and ranking systems. But as I show you these images of the systems, what I want you to sort of consider is they're, because so much of the information is secret and the way it's transformed is secret, we're sort of dealing with like a hall of mirrors, okay? And, or you can think of it almost like a black hole where you can't really see what's going on in the black hole. It's sucked in all the light, but you can sort of see what happens on the edge of the black hole. And so this is similarly some of these processes. We can watch, for example, a snapshot in time of what some people think, other people think is the relative quality of other entities when they rank or rate them, but it's really hard to really get to rock bottom. But I'm gonna try to give you some examples that'll sort of dramatize the problems and maybe propose some solutions. So a first one that I think is really an interesting dilemma for anyone that uses Facebook or if you have kids that use Facebook and others is it's really hard to understand why Facebook, for example, is showing you certain stories and not other stories, and why it might be attaching your name, like, likeness, um, a message that you like something to other things. So one little piece of news you can use that I could give you tonight is, a lot of people don't realize that, say, if you like a page on Facebook, let's say that you liked the New York Times, or you liked the Charlotte Observer, or you liked some other page or some other entity that's on Facebook, Facebook will attribute to you your liking everything that comes out of that page. <laughs> right. so, so, you know, you may like something because you see a certain sports story or something, or you may like a certain publication because, you know, it has a, it has a cute puppy one day on it, and then the next day it could be like, you know, Frank Pasquale likes um, this very controversial topic. Um, and that could be presented, and you have no idea who's seeing that, how they're seeing it, how long they're seeing it, how long they'll see it for. Um, one of the other things that I think is really interesting about it is even if you pick, within Facebook, there's these two sides of the thing that say um, you can pick top stories or most recent. You might think that most recent is everything that you could see being presented to you versus top stories being an algorithmically curated portion of the stories out there. That's not actually the case. You know, top, most recent is itself sort of a construction of Facebook. And so that makes it very hard for us to really comprehend deeply the information environment that's around us. And to give you a really concrete example of why that can matter and why our lack of ability to understand the ordering of information matters, it's been shown that if Facebook reminds people that they should vote on voting day, that that reminder can increase the likelihood of their voting by 0.6%. And you know, a lot of elections are decided by less than half a percent, right? And so there's a way in which, you know, if they decide a certain group of people, they want to spice their feed with reminders to vote and say, here's where you vote. 
and then other people they decide they don't want to do that too. That could really have a very influential impact. Um, but we really don't have a way of assessing that impact, really understanding it, because let's say you tried to scrape one million Facebook pages, you could go to jail for violating Facebook's terms of service, right? So this is a black box. This is a black box in which we don't really understand how the information environment is being created. And if you really tried hard to understand it, you yourself could be in trouble for automated access to the website, which under the, Elect the ECPA Act would be troubling and problematic for you. Um, another example, I just on a more humorous level is, um, this is often called corrupt personalization. So here is a dramatization of someone that, you know, she at one point liked McDonald's. Maybe she liked a McDonald's salad. Well, later, McDonald's, here it says, um, they put her face and name next to the McDonald's chicken nugget promotion. And I know it's hard to read, but she says, it's a lie, I'm a vegetarian. You know, but, <laughs> but, but she could say, you know, it's a lie, I'm a vegetarian on her page, but is she really gonna be able to reach out to everybody who might have seen that? She has no idea, and knowing who saw that particular ad, that is another black box protected by trade secrecy. Um, so another example I love to give is credit scores. So you've probably all seen the ad for credit scores out there, right? And what we've moved to over the uh, history of evaluating individual credit worthiness is we've gone from credit histories to credit reports to credit scores. Uh, we've gone to a time in which like in the 50s and 60s, people would sort of be distributing like histories about people, like narrative understandings of what went wrong in their life, what went right uh, or in terms of their credit worthiness. And then we moved on more to these scores. And the idea behind the score was that you'd get rid of the human element of bias, right? There was this concern that if people were just making credit decisions on the basis of a report, well, they could be biased. So we're gonna try to boil down everyone's credit worthiness to a score. And that's what you see, for example, with these, you know, these three representatives of someone who might have two really good credit scores and one really bad one. But the problem that has come about uh, here is again, it can be really hard to know whether the score is really accurate reflecting conditions of your life. So for one example that was actually almost legislated was after Hurricane Katrina, Congress tried to, there was a bill proposed that would say for people in that area who weren't able to pay their bills, that credit rating companies would have to take into account in their scoring the fact that they'd been through a disaster. But that was pushed back against. It was sort of seen as, well, don't interfere with our way of speaking about other people, characterizing their credit worthiness. That's controversial, I admit. But I think that we really need a lot more trust in these entities. We need to be able to develop more trust in these entities before we accept and put such high stakes on what scores they provide for us. That would be one message. And you might ask, well, why do I? And by the way, this, just this week, Attorney General Schneiderman of New York got a settlement with the three major credit bureaus that essentially is forcing them to be much more responsive to consumer concerns. Because there's the concern that they weren't actually letting people even just correct the basic facts in the report let alone make the scores um, responsive to, say, some moral characteristics or a moral judgment about how they had handled credit as opposed to just a strictly big database one. I also think we have to watch the watchdogs. Essentially, these credit bureaus with their scores are sort of watchdogging us, right? And I think a big goal of ours has to be to watch the watchdogs. And why do I say that? Well, you've probably all seen these commercials on television where you have the guys singing about how they once had a great credit score and then they didn't and they wish they'd kept track of their credit, et cetera. Um, this is sort of a very festive commercial you often see on the air. Well, it turns out that when law required these companies to give people access to their credit reports on a site called annualcreditscore.com, the companies responded by creating freecreditscore.com where you had to pay for your credit report. <laughs> And so the government actually in 2009 went to the trouble of making a satire spoof site, a satire ad that's down there satirizing the other ad that was satirizing the people that were, you know, had low credit scores. <laughs> so again, we come back to our hall of mirrors problem, right? We have this question of like, we have to decide whom to trust, whom to grant credit to, and who not to. And sometimes the entities to which we entrust that responsibility maybe are not acting as responsibly as they should. Now, I know the former general counsel of Inspirian. I've talked to people at various companies. You know, they work hard. They try very hard. And I would say, actually, they do a better job often than many Silicon Valley companies. They're at least trying to keep their records clear, whereas like, oftentimes, uh, say, a Google search on somebody can return all sorts of items that are, not very, uh, that are very troubling or may not be accurate, et cetera. So I give them a lot of credit for actually being responsible in some ways, but maybe they need to be more so. Um, 
Another idea that you know, we have to come uh, start discussing, I think, in more detail is this concept of cyber hygiene. So lots of folks are encouraged by uh, companies in the big data arena that they should essentially exercise cyber hygiene and that they should watch out what they do online and what they say. But this, if it ever was an effective strategy, is becoming a less effective one because big data methods are enabling lots of companies to attribute, say, conditions to individuals regardless of what they try to do or not do. So I've written extensively about people being, there are lists out there of, of hundreds of thousands of people who are listed as diabetic. And you might say, well, wait a second, that's a, that's a health condition. Isn't that covered by HIPAA? But in fact, HIPAA only covers covered entities and their business associates. So if someone can figure out or can attribute to you the status of being a diabetic based on, say, looking at uh, big data of all the people who had a certain buying pattern and you fall into that buying pattern, they can attribute that characteristic to you on the basis of information that is not at all affected by HIPAA or HIPAA protections. So that's a really concerning thing. And, and these characterizations, they get very invasive to the point where one company had a, what they called a rape sufferers list. They would sell at seven to 15 cents a name the names of people who had been rape victims. And there are other companies that were selling the names and address of police officers, of uh, veterans, other, other sort of sensitive categories, you know, where they, it, it, sensitive for all different reasons, you know, where we might really worry about why are these, these lists sort of floating around out there? And is there any way to sort of get a handle on them? And I think that is very problematic. This is Senator Rockefeller who was investigating these things, and it was his work in a group called Privacy Forum that really uh, lifted the lid on this. But if they had not done a rather dogged effort in terms of subpoenaing this information, of getting people sort of from the industry to speak before Congress, we may never have known of the existence of some of these lists. And I think they're very troubling. Another thing that, you know, to bring it back to um, on a level that I think is, you know, the question whether we can really protect or control our reputations and whether we want to. You may have seen this story in the, New York, in the Wall Street Journal, and to make a long story short, the idea behind these different prices that show up here is that there are algorithmically, when you look for hotels or for travel opportunities, if you're searching for, from a Mac, they will assume you are richer than person searching from a PC. <laughs> Okay? They'll say, oh, the person who splurged on a Mac, they're going to be interested in, say, much more expensive opportunities than the person who's like the cheap uh, PC user. Now, that was at a given time, right? This may have changed over the past two years. I don't know. Maybe it got you know, better. But all things being equal, if all they know about you is like PC or Mac, they can sort of frame things in this way. And you know, some people sort of were very upset by, at this as a form of price discrimination. I mean, I don't really care one way or the other that much, although I'd love to hear from people that are upset about it because I, I always want to hear that, that perspective. But I just sort of, what I think what it shows is, you know, maybe I want to, for some purposes, signal that I am into the high-end opportunities or not. I don't know. But I think, that, but the key thing is I think that we have to change about this information environment is people at least need to know, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Um, another example here is I've been giving you all these examples about us as individuals. Um, you may know, you know, with Google search engines, uh, or with that search engines in general, and well, let's face it, it's usually Google, um, people have organic search, those, uh, those uh, listings are not paid. The paid search on the sides and on the other sides is uh, that you do pay for. Now, one thing to note about that segregation is, first of all, it was recommended in 2002 by the Federal Trade Commission. Okay, so that does have some basis in law. It's not just something that the designers in Silicon Valley thought of they actually had to respond to Federal Trade Commission guidelines about what was deceptive advertising, what was not. But what I find very interesting about this is that it creates essentially a new form of an arms race to become the first site in the organic search phase, uh, even if you don't want to pay. And what I think is so interesting here in terms of like from a business angle, in terms of being someone who's a business that wants to sort of have your business be spread on the web is that you are facing the black box of if you try tactics that are too aggressive, you will be thrown out of the organic search results. So you could do something like you could tell all your friends, hey, link to my site. Maybe that'll raise it up in the rankings. But if you were to go out and pay somebody to build 100 links to your site, then you're knocked off. And the reason I have the gourmet gift basket up here is there's the, one of the best stories out there is this company called gourmetgiftbaskets.com that was dying to be the first result when people wanted to buy a gourmet gift basket for someone. And they tried and they competed really hard, but at one point they competed a little too hard. 
they bought a few too many links or they had too many websites out there that they sort of manipulated their ranking with and they were kicked off. And the CEO of the company said, I had to fill out a document that's known as the Google Confessional. <laughs> I had to go through and I had to confess my sins to Google and say, yes, I'm very sorry, Sergey and Larry, but I hired someone to do this. And I had this other search engine optimization technique that's known as black hat versus white hat. Black hat is bad search engine optimization. White hat is good search engine optimization in the parlance of the industry, et cetera. What's also so interesting here, too, is that people are doing now, they used to do search engine optimization only. Now they do reputation engine optimization via LinkedIn. So I consider that part of my teaching. When I'm teaching my students, I'm like, here are some key words that I want you to put into your LinkedIn profile so if there's a resume search for you for a particular type of position, you're going to be someone that's going to show up. Okay? That's part of like my practical training to them about how to survive in this new digital environment. But so, many, so few people like really think critically about, well, is there a way to work that system or not? Um, now, I've given you, you know, here was the simple search thing page, right? And what I always heard from the Google people when I would give these talks about how we had to sort of make this fair or disclose sponsorship better is they'd say, yeah, that's old search. Here's new search, okay? New search is like a, a search for a hotel in New York. And here again, you might wonder, you know, how am I gonna know exactly who paid to be there and who didn't, right? Do I really know? Like you may see way up there in the red box it has like sponsored, I mean, and do I know, did Pennsylvania Hotel pay for that? Or, oh, my, you know, it's funny, I, I, that, that's a bad hotel. Anyone know? <laughs> but I, I mean, there's some hotels that are like really bad. You, you would not want to stay, right? Like I, having lived there a few years, no, they're like in a very noisy area. And so it becomes like another question of trust, right? The question being, how exactly did those get there? And will we ever be able to learn how they got there? By the way, there, Folks in Europe may have a better chance at that because there the antitrust authorities are a bit more aggressive. In the US, they have not been so aggressive. But you know, facing these interfaces, I think that this may be a whole new area of teaching, of majors, of ways of people understanding the web is thinking critically about these interfaces and thinking about what's sponsored, what's not, how did some companies get there, how did they not get there. Um, let me give you some examples from healthcare. Okay, so here if you searched for a hospital, say this given hospital um, in Texas, Methodist Hospital, you'd see these reviews, okay? And I'll, uh, I'll go through these next slides relatively quickly because it's a, it's a series of steps about how we might improve this or how we might not improve it. Look, if you look at the ratings that are given, the rationales for review, um, pay parking down there, is there a little, yeah, pay parking, probably not the best way to pick your hospital. <laughs> You know, <laughs> the, the wise healthcare consumer, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe though that's a big deal. Maybe all the doctors are the same and really the only way they differ is the parking, but I doubt it. Um, and I think that, and, and one of the things that I find kind of troubling about this, and you know, as an author, you could find this troubling. If you write a book and you find like someone could be the, the leading authority on your field and give the book five stars, and then someone can just like rant against you and give it one star, and then hey, it averages out to three stars. You know, and, and you wonder about, you know, how do you make the rating system better? Well, someone actually proposed an improvement, which was instead of having these sort of consumer-driven rankings, you would put up rankings from Medicare Hospital Compare, and you would put up the LeapFrog group ratings. And all of LeapFrog Group is just, th those ratings, or the ones that are shown here, are about objective outcomes that are patient safety indicators, right? So in this hospital, it has many good ones, but that last one, I'm sorry that it's hard to read, but the last one says essentially patients with ventilators probably have worse than average outcomes at this particular hospital, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, but, but what's amazing about this, though, is you know, that on some level is an improvement. You know, but I mean, getting a C, though, you can imagine, they'd be very upset getting a C grade. And they'd probably want to dispute that. Um, and you've got, and it, it, this is all hypothetical. But what is happening right now is that Google is working with the Mayo Clinic, with health domain experts, so that if you do a search on, say, mole that is three inches in diameter and has this texture, you're not just going to get like the most popular websites according to the random algorithm you're going to get websites that are somewhat curated by folks at the Mayo Clinic that are working with Google. And I think that's actually a step in the right direction. I don't know if this is the right ranking, but um, it could be. However, let me add a little bit more. That was seen as an improvement, but we just saw a study in March 2015 that said, well, actually, the national hospital rating systems that we just saw are, they all disagree, right? 
And that was a controversy. And I can tell you that if you go into the four major ones that were part of the study, it's amazing how long the methodology sections are. It's really hard to understand how hospital ratings and rankings work and how what is actually risk adjustment, what is not, what's gaming the system. Um, I think the US News one is over like 70 pages long. So that becomes complicated. But I also like to ask in the book, is that even the direction we should be going in? Okay. And here's the, how I try to dramatize that question, which is, imagine if all the ranking systems agreed and we could all say, oh wow, there's the best hospital and there's the worst hospital, and you can predict what's going to happen, right? People are just not going to go to the worst hospital and it's going to go out of business. Well, sometimes that may well be a good outcome. Like if the worst pizza place in Charlotte goes out of business, no harm, no foul. And I can certainly tell you there's lots of terrible pizza in Baltimore where I wish would go out of business. You know, maybe, maybe there'll be a perfect pizza ranking system that'll get rid of them. But what you see on this screen is essentially this is a dramatization of the lack of many hospital facilities in the outer boroughs of New York City uh, and the versus like the people that are in Manhattan. And what you see in the problem here is that um, this, is, this is from a ProPublica game called Heart Saver. And this is a rather serious game, is what the artist Harun Faraki calls serious games. And the seriousness of this game is some red person on this, this uh, map will light up, and then to play the game, you're told they've just had a heart attack and they need to get to a hospital, and you need to get them to the nearest hospital. Okay? And this, this game sort of dramatizes for folks what happens, say, if the bottom tier falls out of a healthcare marketplace. So you, if you're playing the game, you're gonna wanna hope that you're over by Central Park, and you're going to be very worried. You'll be happy if you're here because you have lots of great hospitals there. You'll be in a bit of trouble if you're there, right, um, for this game. So that, I think, really shows that, like, sometimes these ranking and rating systems, we need to step back. And, like, in the legal discourse, so many folks are saying, oh, we need to make it as transparent as possible and as standardized as possible. And sometimes I say, well, yes, but let's always be really respectful of the domain we're operating in. Um, so let me just leave everybody with this idea, which I think is, you know, I, I've shown a lot of pictures, so I, I think I've earned my little bit of text, um, <laughs> which is uh, there's something called Campbell's Law. It's a sociologist who said that if you've got any quantitative social indicator or even some qualitative ones, the more it's used, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures, and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it's intended to monitor. So I think that what we have to think about in our increasingly black box society is how do we conscientiously respond to the potential for gaming these indicators, the black box nature of them, the lack of transparency, the negative effects they can have if they are indeed transparent, and how we can do more to improve outcomes overall, um, not just about transparency, but about making clear and intelligible our overall goals for these systems. So, with that, I just would love to hear your questions, and I've got more slides to show if, you, if there are no questions, but I'd love to get your questions on, as it, the, the talk. So thank you. <laughs> so we have two students, uh, I think, uh, Ryan and Gabriella, the Levine scholars, uh, who have mics. And so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and we, should, um, we can have one question for Is there a way to get our personal information withdrawn once it's out there? <laughs> what a fantastic question. So this is, there are some legal regimes that will allow you to get rid of inaccurate information. So for example, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, if there's something inaccurate on your credit report, you can get rid of that. Um, with respect to what we care most about often, which is say, search results, like from Google, like what's the first search results on my name? In the US, there's really nothing you can do. What Google will say, if it's, tr if it's true or if you can't sort of prove it defamatory in court, you could sort of try to prove it defamatory and then try to sue the publisher, but then on the other hand, it could just be republished or just come up over and over again. What's really interesting though is that in Europe, there's something called the right to be forgotten. So if a result comes up on your name, that is something that is like really outdated or really def like problematic or the case that was involved was somebody didn't pay a bill 20 years before and he later paid the bill, but the fact that the, this news story about him not paying the bill was still the first result on his name 20 years later. And he was very upset about that because people, is, you know, everybody knows as soon as you meet somebody, often you'll Google them or you'll look at who their Facebook friends are, et cetera. 
And so this person went and the European court said, yeah, you have a right to have that delisted because it is just irrelevant to your current profile or it's unduly prejudicial, et cetera. So we might take some inspiration from that. And I actually think that there are some areas where, for example, like with the iCloud photo hack, you know, there were lots of people whose intimate photos were just put out there on the web. And I think the intermediaries are beginning to respond and saying, let's not make those searchable anymore. Okay, let's try to stop that. By the way, just one last legal point is, let's say that you have a compromising picture of a person who's online. If the person took that as a selfie, they're in luck because that's copyrighted and they own the copyright. If someone else took the picture of them, they're out of luck because they can't use copyright law to get it down. <laughs> so that's a really odd, I mean, and that's kind of a completely random, unintended consequence of a series of, of laws, but that's what it is. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, oh, sorry. I work in public health, and uh, a lot of times we look at rankings of communities by health metrics, uh -huh. and it is tended to use to drive policy decisions. Hmm. The validity of that now seems pretty questionable. <laughs> I mean, I'm not particularly familiar with the, the particular ratings and rankings that you're discussing, but would this be sort of um, health disparities research or, or other? That or Charlotte was ranked one of the lowest, healthiest communities in the country. Ah, and right. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Okay. <laughs> now I, no, not about Charlotte, but I mean. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Here's, here's, here's my redemptive response, I promise, which is, okay, so I can imagine maybe one indicator that would go into that. Like men's, health, men's fitness or whatever, health journal, I often see these, and it's often driven by obesity and smoking rates, right? I mean, I think that's often like what they do. And what's really interesting about this sort of stuff is, first of all, with respect to obesity, like if they're using... Uh, overweightness as being an indicator of unhealthiness, like say a BMI between 25 and 30, it's been found that actually the people between 25 and 30 live longer than the folks that have, which I find a great relief. Like, I'm always like, yes, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so at some level, the coarseness of that indicator is very troubling, right? Because there could be so many ways in which, and if it's all physical health, what about mental health? Like, what if everybody's like much happier? You know, have you seen like, you know, the, it's, there are places where everybody's miserable all the time. So, I mean, I think that's a great question about, you know, how this could effectively be used to defame communities. And I'll give one other example, which was a, a proposal I did recently that, you know, it wasn't ultimately accepted, but I think it's a really important idea that I'm going to try to pursue, which is health, the idea behind health disparities research is that you would find certain areas and find certain areas in a certain city and town and say, wow, those are the least healthy. Let's publicize that they're the least healthy and that will shame the healthcare system into serving them, okay? Well, you can guess there's lots of other people that are interested in that information, like life insurers, right? So you may like do the health disparities research in the name of helping the least healthy area, but then if you've got laws that permit, say, life insurers to then say, oh wow, least healthy area, don't underwrite there, very troubling. Thoughts, other questions? Or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question around um, uh, auto insurance. Yeah. So I know that my car collects a lot of information about how I drive that I really don't want my insurance company to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, my curiosity is around sort of where does the law stand on that now in terms of what they can have access to and permission, opt-in, opt-out, et cetera. Oh, excellent question. So. I have a couple of, of and just to, to again, to discuss the stakes, there are now folks that say that given big data processes, you can predict someone's credit score from how they drive and how they drive from their credit score. Okay. Um, if you have a, and it's called the Discriminatory Inferences Project at University of Colorado. They're, they're investigating this sort of effort. And what's, what we're seeing now in response in the law is that this is all known as the Internet of Things, of sort of connecting Internet-based sensors all over and different in your cars, et cetera. I believe that as of 2013, Scott Pepit is the leading scholar in this area. He said there were four states that restricted insurers from conditioning discounts or coverage on having the black box in it. And I believe one of the four states was Virginia. So I think in Virginia, they actually were far-sighted enough 
Well, I don't want to go either way on this one. I mean, I would say they were far-sighted at least to recognize the problem. And they said, we've got to essentially make it so that you can't force people into having this thing uh, into their car or make the discount so high. This comes back also, uh, uh, by the way, to the, the obesity and wellness sort of issue in the sense of wellness programs now. So there are all these wellness programs where employers are trying to get people to be more healthy and to act more healthily. That can be a good thing. But on the other hand, you know, if they say require employees or ask them to keep track of the number of steps they take per day via a cell phone based pedometer, then you essentially are accidentally spilling over to them a great deal of data about where you are all the time, you know, how you walk, et cetera. And I think that is kind of problematic. I think that could be a real problem in terms of, because we do have evidence of what should have been protected health information driving discriminatory decisions. So, yeah. but great question. I know uh, black boxes are not really diabolical, but if you're looking for a, a flight from Charlotte to, say, Rome, uh -huh. and you then search it again and again and again, does it know that you're really interested and actually raise the price on that flight? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the sad thing is that what's, what, part of the nature of these systems is they start learning. So, I mean, in some ways, like, we're trying to fake out the system that's trying to fake out us. It's like it's a problem game theory, right? So, like, if we were to all, if I were to say, I figured it out, folks, only look three times, and that's how you're going to get the cheapest fare. Eventually, then, they would say, oh, wow, these people seem to have learned our algorithm, and they, they try to, you know, use another approach. So, I, I can't say, I don't really know, I think, but I do think that, Part of my, the reason why I work with this Council on Big Data Ethics and Society, which is, sort of helps the, the National Science Foundation and some other entities, is because we want to enable people to be able to research that question, right? And right now, it's really, really hard to research that question. I know people that sort of research with Facebook, and what they've told me is that the API has become increasingly restrictive, so they can't do the research they want to do. And so I think this is an area where, you know, encouraging Business, industry, like sometimes business, it, businesses can learn a lot from universities. And maybe we, I, what I want to see in like the broader picture is how do we create a research environment so that universities can learn a bit more about what they're up to. Um, by the way, can, a question here? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was an article in the Charlotte Observer today about creepy Hello Barbie. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you can address, should our children be buying a Hello Barbie that has a doll conversation with our child that goes into the iCloud and answers our child's questions. And the question may be, are your parents going to be gone this weekend? Uh, right, right, yeah. What are the implications of that? Yeah, that is a, a terrific question about sort of bringing home what the Internet of Things could be. You know, you think about even the, the movie Her, about, you know, someone who sort of falls in love with their cell phone or something, or, you know, and you think about how manipulative this can be. One thing I would note is that I think people have to be really careful about how this data is repurposed. So, for example, recently the uh, uh, Obama administration has looked into, say, use of educational data and, and trying to get pledges from ed tech companies that they wouldn't, say, have secondary uses of, you know, ed tech data. So, for example, they may say, we're just keeping track of you in a certain way, but then later we sell it for advertising. That, I think, could be very problematic. Here, with the um, example of the doll, one thing we should also be aware of is just how much voice information has been parsed algorithmically. So, for example, when you call someone in a call center, they often, you'll hear, this call is being recorded for quality purposes. Well, part of the quality purposes is, A, to develop a voice print of you personally, to avoid fraud. So I think there's 60 million voice prints uh, in the databases already. And B, to sort of to have reports after your call that will say have three key indicators about the person you were like. Like say, you know, angry but amenable to reason or something like that. <laughs> Creepy Phil. Creepy Phil. <laughs> <laughs> And, and what this, this voice print will do is like that then helps them route you algorithmically to someone who is most like you, right? So one of the things, though, to think about, just to come back to the Barbie example that I think is sort of a, a more hopeful 
uh, approach, although this may seem like closing the barn door after the barn has left, is um, there's ways in which you can design technology so that it at least notifies people that it is being used in a certain way. So for example, when Google Glass came out, I felt that like part of Google Glass should be that whenever people with Google Glass, the sort of recording in the, in the glasses, whenever they did that, there should be a red light on that would indicate to anyone around them that they were being recorded in that way. And so I think to apply that to Creepy Barbie, perhaps she should have like red glowing eyes <laughs> whenever she, you know. <laughs> so that, I don't know, but I mean, but by the way, in terms of legislation, that has actually been legislative really proposed in something called the Your TV is Watching You Act. Um, so, so there are these new smart TVs that will record you, and, and um, by the way, there's actually a patent out there that has, the patent is on the idea that, uh, you know how sometimes TV ads can be very long, so the idea here is that people are sitting down, and then the TV will be recording the person, and if they say, if there's a McDonald's ad, they say, McDonald's! then the ad ends and they can watch the program again. <laughs> so, so, so this to me is, you know, a very, <laughs> I mean, that to me is a very frightening picture of the future. It's perhaps is a more efficient future and that could be tied into their wellness program to show that they had actually moved more. Uh, <laughs> But you know, I think that this is a very troubling vision of the future and we have to sort of be able to think very critically about it and to say, okay, at least with the TV watching you or the creepy Barbie or whatever it is, that we have some external indicator that it is recording things about you. So yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, speaking of the future, uh -huh. uh, we're in the infancy of all of this. I mean, this happened yeah. in, our, in our lifetime. Do you imagine a time in your lifetime where the entire distinction between personal information and public information will just disappear? And if so, will it change how we fundamentally understand ourselves as persons? Yeah. That is a, that's a fantastic question. And I, I believe that that is a clear and present danger. Um, and the reason why is uh, due to an economic model called unraveling. So, for example, imagine that you're a student and like you've got your resume and you've got to decide whether you put your GPA on the resume or not. You know, it's pretty obvious people with like a high GPA are going to put that on the resume. Others may not want to highlight, highlight that on their resume. But the problem becomes that once you get a certain tipping point where say 60% of the students are putting their GPA on the resume, everybody's got to, or else you're going to assume when you get one without the GPA, wow, that person must have a really low GPA, right? And I think that is the issue that we're facing in so many areas of life. So for example, to come back to the car insurance example, you know, at first they'll all say, everybody has the right to choose. You can have it or not have it. But then once you have a tipping point and like 70% of the insureds are having it, then you actually have to have it. Similarly, privacy in the certain AT&T network was recently pri priced out at $29 a month. It was like, if you agree to pay $29 extra a month, they would not use your internet surfing habits to develop a ad profile about you, okay? So, I mean, I have to say, I'm not going to pay that, you know. <laughs> I mean, I just am like, because there's so many other people that have it. Now, to get to your point about how we understand ourselves, that's why in the last chapter of the book, I look at some literary figures. I look at um, Gary Steingart in particular. He has this book called Super Sad True Love Story, which is a brilliant book about exactly what you're describing. It's a, it's a world in which, essentially, when people meet, instantly, um, it is sort of transmitted to the person, what the person's um, occupation, education, net worth, income, credit score, uh, et cetera, is. Okay, he imagines what happens in a society where that is instantly transmissible information about everybody. Um, and that, I think, is very troubling. And I've tried to explore in this essay, actually, in a, in a publication called The Hedgehog Review. Um, I have a, a, and it goes, the reason it's called that is because of the uh, Isaiah Berlin distinction between the Hedge, the fox knows many things and the hedgehog knows one big thing. And I, I love the, the, the articles in this review. I, I felt so happy to be part of it because I tried to say that, yes, if you have that type of society, it does fundamentally change our sense of identity and it sort of instrumentalizes people to an extent that I think is, is deeply troubling and ultimately stunting their ability to grow and learn and, and, and be creative. So, yeah. Frank? Um. I, I enjoyed your presentation this afternoon, and oh, thanks. This, this evening is no, no different. However, I have two, a two-part question. One is, um, what is your sense of the solution to the black box? 
Uh, is it increased transparency, um, more laws or better laws, or increased conceptions of rights? That's the first part. The other part is with respect to your reference to Facebook and to Google. I agree with you that Pennsylvania hospital, uh, a, a hotel is a terrible hotel. <laughs> unless, uh, un unless you want to watch a, a good hockey game across the street. But, but, yes. but that, that, that's, that's that. But um, what is then the, 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 the alternative to the Facebook and the, the Google of the world on this? Great. Look, well, I'll, I'll give two answers that I think are, they're, they're not going to give you the full flavor of the, of the vision, but I think they'll be um, indicators of what, where I would like to see society go. So one is, um, for example, with respect to credit scores, a lot of the use of credit scores, it wasn't like that just came out of the free market magically or organically out of the free market. A lot of it was driven by very obscure Fannie Mae rules about, say, the degree to which number of people who are, say, uh, in a mortgage-backed security, whether that could be reinsured by certain quasi-governmental entities. And by the way, like Fannie Mae itself is a bit of a slate of hand, right? Because the whole reason why it's like quasi-governmental is because Lyndon Baines Johnson wanted to take it off the books in 1968 so he could continue funding both the Vietnam War and the Great Society, right? So it sort of is like that is a, that issue of like why we have sort of credit scoring is in large part an artifact of laws that could be changed. And what I propose in the book is that you could actually have a mandate that say 10% of loans or 5% of loans have to be given out according to a public credit scoring algorithm, okay? Now, maybe it'll be disastrous. You know, maybe it should only be 1% of loans. Maybe it should just be a tiny pilot program. But coming out of the healthcare area where I come out of, you know, we have in healthcare pilot programs all the time. I mean, in gain sharing uh, is a way in which they try to save money in healthcare um, by encouraging surgeons to, to sort of buy uh, equipment in bulk together. And that was a pilot program. There, I can give you like many, many pilot programs in healthcare. And I think what we have to start doing is looking at these other sectors and say, having pilot programs where we use publicly accessible, publicly understandable algorithms. And my bet would be, I mean, I'm willing to bet a lot that if they used a publicly accessible, publicly understandable credit scoring algorithm uh, in, say, a certain percentage of loans, I don't think they'd turn out that much worse. Okay? I honestly don't think they would. Um, with respect to your point about the um, hotel and you know, advertising a hotel and things like that, that's one where you know, Google's been in this antitrust battle with Europe forever. And the reason why it's been in this battle is because Europe is worried that essentially Google will disintermediate everything. So you'll just, when you search for a hotel, you won't go to Kayak or Travelocity or Expedia or anything like that. It's just going to be Google Hotel. And when you search for weather, it won't be Weather Spark, which by the way, it's a great weather site. Um, <laughs> weather Underground, Weather.com, you're just going to see Google Weather. And by the way, one of the things I found kind of funny is like I'll type into Google 10 day forecast for Baltimore and it'll come back Google weather seven day forecast. And I'm like, that's not what I wanted. You know? <laughs> you know? And so in, in Europe, it, as part of this sort of battle with the European authorities, Google said, look, stop bothering us. And what we'll do is we'll put three alternative services on the front page each time. So rather than just giving you like Google hotels and Google insurance, and Google Weather, et cetera, we're going to have the Google product and then also three entities that we don't own. Okay? And I actually think that may be a step toward a solution. I also, you know, I mean, things about thinking about, I would love to see diversity of rating and ranking systems because to me, so often the rating and ranking system is kind of opaque or it's just based on these very crude indicators that we discussed. I care only about how quiet the hotel is. Right? <laughs> like that to me is like, I mean, I do a lot of travel with like the book and other things and like, I just want a good night's sleep. But I can vary, it's very hard to find that as like a ranking and rating mechanism. I'd like to create a world in which say, there could be quiethotels.com that could, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Actually, maybe that's my business, I don't know. But, but I, I'm gonna have to do it in Europe because I, I think Google is just gonna, you know, put me on the 15th page if I do it here. Um, but, you know, I think that could be one, one way in which things could get better. Okay, so, so in the United States, we have something called the Bill of Rights. So do you imagine that it's possible to develop something called the Bill of Rights in the digital age for individuals? Uh -huh. A wonderful question. And actually, um, there have been a couple already developed. So Lori Andrews, Lori Andrews has this book that uh, called, um, rather chillingly, I Know Who You Are and I Saw What You Did, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and her book actually includes exactly this. It includes a Bill of Rights for the Digital Age that she proposes, and I think it's a good one. And it's particularly appropriate given that we are in the year uh, 2015, the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, right? 800 years ago, and you're going to see a lot of celebrations at law schools of this original effort, you know, to make accountable a sovereign. And I guess if there's one um, takeaway point that I would, I would give you all for this evening would be that in some ways a lot of these very large entities, these corporations, are a bit like sovereigns of the web. You know, Facebook has like 900 million people. It has more people than the U.S. does or the EU. And to some extent we have to start thinking about are there modes of accountability that will ensure that their governance continues to promote innovation and doesn't sort of overly invade our privacy and creates opportunities for other companies and other folks to emerge. Thanks. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.